In order to really understand the last week of Jesus' life, you have to understand that Jesus uh, was fulfilling the Father's will and that he was totally submitted to the Father. And actually, what you see in the life of Jesus is the old unfolding almost of the entirety of the Hebrew Scriptures. Jesus was on a schedule, he was on the clock, and he was moving with great purpose and intention. And uh, again, uh, some people have thought about this. When did Jesus first realize that he was born to die? Well, we'll have to ask him, <laughs> because I'm not sure. But there are three Old Testament passages that are unfolding in this last week of Jesus' life. They, they set the schedule. And uh, the first one is Daniel 9, 24 through 26. Daniel said, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. That's a mouthful and a half. But if you think that's a mouthful, wait till you see the next verse. Next one. So you're to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there'll be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Now, this is uh, very difficult to explain in a short amount of time. And so I am, uh, I am just really speaking to the math people for a moment. And then you need to explain it to everybody else. <laughs> but, but listen, I didn't write this. It's in the Word of God. So you can say, I'm not a math person. Well, you, you tell that to, to the Lord. I didn't do it. And, and so if you look carefully, then after, are we there? Did we, next one. Okay. Then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. Now let me explain that just, just a moment, because I know Hebrew. It means after 62 weeks, the Messiah will die. You got that. He'll be cut off from physical life, from his community. And someone even makes the case that the Hebrew word for to be cut off means that he is separated uh, from the Father. I think maybe it means that, but it certainly means that he dies. And so the death of the Messiah is predicted of course, in Isaiah 53, but it's also predicted in Daniel 9, 24 through 26. But it's not just that he will die, it's when he will die. So the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war, desolations are determined. Okay, and now we're entering sort of into... Uh, the Olivet Discourse that Jesus gave on the Mount of Olives and spoke about tough times in the future. You know there are tough times ahead, right? Yes. I mean, you can spiritualize the whole thing. If you spiritualize the whole thing, it's even worse because that means it's all in you. So uh, tough times are ahead before they get better. You believe that? Yes. I'm sorry, but it's true. So now I've done a chart, okay? Now, it's okay if you don't understand the chart. I barely understand the chart, okay? I'm not good at math, uh, but it's good to understand the chart. And you don't have to get all the days and all the moments, and a lot of the items that I'm gonna speak about tonight, the chronology of the last week of Jesus' life, some of you, of you are not gonna understand, and some of you are gonna really understand and really disagree. Could you just hold on to that for a moment, okay? Hear me out. And at, and at the book table, you can talk about it with Raphael. So, <laughs> so all I want to do is show you the, in a chart what the verse said. All right? So basically, Daniel is saying that there are 490 years, 70 times 7, that are going to unfold and reveal the purposes and plan of God. Now, how do we know that... The weeks refer to a year. Well, because we didn't create that, Jeremiah did. Jeremiah understood that the Jewish people went into exile for 70 years, one week. Why? Because they didn't obey the sabbatical year for 490 years, okay? Or uh, 49 years, something like that. Anyway. 
And so what you have, the time really kicks in at the Edict of Artaxerxes in 444 BC. So Daniel says, from the time of that edict, start the countdown, and you have uh, 69 weeks. And so here's where it begins, uh, 70 weeks. Here's where it begins. Uh, so there are many decrees. There's about three or four of them. But this is the one to rebuild Jerusalem. And everybody knows that happened in 444 BC or BCE. So seven weeks uh, from that, uh, uh, Jerusalem was in the process of being rebuilt. We add 62 weeks, which gets us to 69 weeks. And if you do the math, it ends up somewhere around 33 AD. Anybody can do that math. You just need a calculator. Some of you who went to New Jersey school system, you could probably do it without a calculator. Those of us from New York, we need a calculator. All right, so 69 weeks, 69 times 7, 483 years, and there you have it, uh, 62 weeks. Now, what, when did it exactly start and when did it exactly end? I'm not quite sure, but I do know that it's awfully coincidental that the prophet said that 483 years, 62 plus 7, would unfold from the declaration, from uh, the uh, Edict of Artaxerxes, until the Messiah is cut off. Coincidental? Probably not. You think Jesus knew about this? Yes. Well, he wrote it, probably. So I think he had a lot of understanding about it. And then comes that last seven years where Christians all disagree. That's the Great Tribulation period divided into two parts, three and a half, three and a half. Some of you think you're going to be here. Some of you don't think you're going to be here. Don't worry. Those of us who don't think we're going to be here and will be raptured, we'll, put out, we'll, we'll grab your hand on the way up. So don't worry. About it. But if you are worried about it, you better start stocking up on water and tuna fish cans. Okay. So Jesus understood Daniel chapter 9. How do I know that? Because he quotes from it. In Matthew 24, he talks about the abomination of desolation that Daniel wrote about. It means Jesus actually studied the book of Daniel. He knew it. So did he understand chapter 9 and the chronology? Much better than I did. So you with me so far? Okay, some of you got it. Good. Now, the uh, second uh, passage that I want to call attention to really is Leviticus 23, because in Leviticus chapter 23, the seven great festivals of Israel are given by God at Mount Sinai to Moses. And, uh, you know, it's one of my favorite songs. It's okay. <laughs> and, and so in Leviticus chapter 23, you have the festivals of... Oh, you can change that. Jaden. Oh, no, I'm not worried about your phone. I'm worried about the PowerPoint. Okay. There you go. Oh, that was... How did we get there? Okay. Um, that's okay, but Jaden, was that the next one? No, it's not in order. No, it's okay. The Exodus one is fine. There you go. Just follow the rules. Okay. And so in Exodus chapter 12, uh, we have uh, the first Passover. It was set as a holiday in Leviticus 23. Uh, but why? Because of what happened during the Exodus. And so all of this that we sang about, about the Lamb of God. Now you understand Jesus is not literally a lamb. But he is the Lamb of God. So what in the world does it mean? Well, you have to understand the first Passover. And so in Leviticus 23, we have the seven great festivals of Israel and the once a week Sabbath outlined. You have four holidays in the spring and you have three holidays in the fall. And the first of the holidays is Passover. Now there's not a lot of information in Leviticus 23 about what happened at Passover, but there's a lot of information about what we're supposed to do. But 
you must go back to the first Passover in order to understand what Passover is all about. So Passover is all about what God did in delivering the Jewish people from Egypt. Everybody understands that. But there was something that happened that became even more important than the Jews being delivered from Egypt. And it's something that, that uh, developed in Scripture and is a very important theme in Scripture. We, we just kept singing about it. And that was the tenth plague. So God said there would be a tenth and deadly plague that would fall upon the Jews or Gentiles, and that the only way to prevent the death of the firstborn males as part of this tenth plague was to take a spotless, unblemished lamb, kill it, pour its blood into a basin, put the blood upon the lentil and the doorposts of the house. Then God would pass over the Jewish home, the son, firstborn son would be protected, and those who did not smear the blood on the doorposts, their firstborn males would die. And that became a very important part of the Bible story. So the Lamb of God first appeared in Exodus chapter 12 and had nothing to do with our salvation, but it had everything to do with the whole idea that the sacrificial idea, because remember, in Exodus there was no temple yet, it was just a tabernacle. The whole idea is that, there would, there, that the Lamb of God dies, his blood is smeared on the doorposts, and the wrath of God passes over those who would have been judged. That's all we know about that first Passover. So think of this as a prophecy in type. Not a specific prophecy like Isaiah 53 or Daniel chapter 9, but it's a prophecy in type. It's a picture of what's going to happen. It's probably sketched in black and white, but then as the story of the Bible unfolds, colors are added until you get to Jesus. And then you really understand who the Lamb of God is. And when he dies, then you really understand what this is all about because he is the Lamb of God. He died, he shed his blood, and when a man or a woman by faith applies the blood of the sacrifice of Jesus, the Lamb of God, to their hearts, then the wrath of God passes over us and we pass from death to life. But what we have in Exodus 12 in the Passover is merely a picture of what is to come. But Jesus understood the picture. The more specific prophecy, of course, is in Isaiah 53. So I'm looking at verse 7. Keep going. Jaden? Perfecto. No, go back. You got it. Perfect. So the prophet, 700 years before Jesus ever walked the earth, the prophet describes in Isaiah chapter 53 the Messiah to come, the servant of the Lord, who would be like the Lamb. Now, how in the world do you understand the Lamb without understanding Exodus? Well, you don't. And so Isaiah 53 builds on Exodus 12. And so Isaiah said he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth like a lamb led to slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he didn't open up his mouth. Why is this so important? Because the lamb in Exodus 12 was perfect and innocent and unblemished. And the lamb that Isaiah describes hundreds of years later is similar. This lamb is obviously a person. This is a metaphor for a person. But this person is like a sheep. He's silent before his shearers. He didn't open up his mouth. And though he was oppressed and afflicted and could have complained, and we know later on he was the Messiah. He could have just probably just blasted all of them, you know. But instead, he humbly went to his death. Just like uh, a lamb. Now, later on, in 1 Peter, we read that we are redeemed with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Messiah. Do you see how this builds? So Peter understands Exodus, he understands Isaiah 53, and he's telling the story. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, 
but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. And so these three prophecies, two specific, one in type, form the background for the last week of Jesus' life. Jesus needed to die when he was supposed to die. And I believe that he knew exactly what Daniel meant. We we're going to approximate it was somewhere around 33 AD. It could have been 30, 31, 32. It doesn't matter. But Jesus knew exactly when he was supposed to die. Jesus knew exactly why he was supposed to die. He was supposed to die as a lamb led to the slaughter to die for our sins. And Jesus would fulfill that prophecy no matter what. And so he was determined, as Raphael mentioned. And so let's uh, just, um, before we go any further, um, I just want to mention one more passage in 1 Peter. It's not on the PowerPoint. And this is a very interesting passage. By the way, you are allowed to open your own Bibles uh, during this. And uh, so you can take out your phones and turn uh, to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1, 10, uh, uh, chapter 1, 10 through 11. Here's the, here's the passage from Peter that really nails it. Peter says, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries. In other words, Isaiah, even Moses as a prophet, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, they knew what was going to happen, but they didn't know who it was or when it was. They made careful searches and inquiring, seeking to know, listen carefully, what person or time the spirit of Messiah within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Messiah and the glories to follow. So in other words, the person was not a mystery to God. The time was not a mystery to God. God knew who it was, and God knew when it was going to happen. And it had to happen on Passover. And so God knew exactly what he was doing. The ancient prophets tried to figure it out. I think the disciples were probably uh, confused as well. But we have the great opportunity to look back on what happened. And we can see that God was working out his plan in incredibly specific ways so that the right person who would fulfill the right prophecies died at the right time for the right reasons. In other words, the entire Old Testament is a gospel tract because it points to this greater fulfillment. Now, uh, Yeshua, Jesus knew exactly uh, what he was doing. Absolutely exactly. And so in Luke chapter 18, you can go to the next PowerPoint slide. In Luke 18, which I don't know if you've covered already, but this is a, a great passage because in Luke 18, uh, Jesus actually spells it all out. He took the 12 aside and said to them, now remember, the 12 were not expecting this. The 12 were still expecting you know, a messianic king who was going to overthrow the Romans and, um, and set up his throne in Jerusalem. But Jesus, in many different ways, throughout his ministry, was trying to get his 12 disciples to understand what he was really doing. And he said, listen, we're going up to Jerusalem. And I'm sure, as he said that to the disciples, they were all shouting, Yes, let's go, you know? Party time, great, kill the Romans, set up the kingdom, off we go. Then I think they got a little disappointed. We're going up to Jerusalem and all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. Well, what are those things? For he will be handed over to the Gentiles, will be mocked, mistreated, spit upon, and after they scourged him, they will kill him and the third day he will rise again. So listen carefully. He not only knew when he was going to die, he knew when he was going to rise. Can you get any more detail? So when Jesus was making that journey that Raphael described previously, every step of the way, 
He knew exactly where he was going, what he was going to do, who was going to do it, and when it was going to happen, and when he was going to conquer death. He was following these incredible uh, prophecies. Now, uh, there were probably eight different things that referred, uh, he referred to here. He's going to go to Jerusalem. It has to happen in Jerusalem. I mean, that was God's intention. That's where he would die. That's where he would set up his throne. He would fall into the hands of Jewish leaders. He'll be condemned to death. The Gentiles will abuse him and uh, mock him. And, uh, you know, as I, I read Isaiah 53 about the rejection of the Messiah, you know, I put it together with John 1 and his own did not receive him. And, and I always viewed the rejection in Isaiah chapter 53 as being basically the rejection by the Jewish people. But in fact, it was also rejection by the Gentiles. So we're all to blame, right? Okay, there goes that argument for anti-Semitism, okay? He will be mocked and spit upon and scourged. The Gentiles will actually kill him. Okay, so if you want to blame anybody for the death of Christ, blame the Italians. <laughs> Raphael's in trouble. He's both Jewish and Italian. You are totally, totally in the doghouse. Okay? The Gentiles will kill him, and then he will rise from the dead on, on the third day. And so all of this is being uh, worked out in that last week. Now, before we look at the chronology a little bit more carefully, I just want to make one point because uh, how many of you in, uh, tonight in the congregation are not Jewish? Would you raise your hand? Okay. All right, good. Okay, that's, that's about the percentage I thought. Um, it's okay. Gentiles can believe in Jesus. It's fine. <laughs> Honestly. Welcome to the family. So, but you may not really understand this. And that is, it's important. The Jewish day begins at night. Did you all get, you all got that? Okay, you can look at the next slide. You see that in the first Passover. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight is the Lord's Passover. Then on the 15th day of the same month, there's a feast of unleavened bread to the Lord for seven days. Eat unleavened bread. So when does Passover begin? At night. When does the Sabbath begin? Friday night. So, you have to understand that as, as we move forward. Now, um, let's look at John chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. So if you have your Bibles, turn to John 12. Because in John chapter 12, there's an incredible hint to the chronology of the last week of Jesus' life. It's a simple little hint, but it really means a lot. In verse 1 of John chapter 12, we read, Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. That's really, really powerful. Did you already cover this, Raphael? A little bit, yeah. Just a little bit. Okay, we'll cover it maybe just a little bit more. Okay, Why is this po powerful? Because Jesus was destined as the Lamb of God to die on Passover, or the type wouldn't work. I'm not building a theology on a type. I'm just telling you, particularly on reflection, that's the way it was deemed to, to happen. That's how God made this to happen. He had to die on Passover. And so everything during this last week, it's all about when the Passover falls. That's the most important piece of chronology to understand the last week of the life of Jesus. And so this is a great hint. So he goes to Bethany six days before the Passover, which makes it the eighth of the Hebrew month, Nisan. That's not a car, it's a month. And Nisan is actually the first month of the Hebrew calendar that God gave on Mount Sinai. So you could technically wish your Jewish friends Happy New Year during March or April when this date falls. However, that would be very weird. 
because we all know that the Jewish New Year is in the fall, as t but that's in the seventh month. You got that? Yeah. Why do we celebrate New Year's in the seventh month? Who the heck knows? We don't know. Tradition? We don't know. But, it's but the first month is Nisan. Nisan. And so Nisan the 14th is Passover. He comes to Bethany uh, six days before, which is the 8th of Nisan. And another uh, thing that's uh, pretty important about uh, Bethany is that Bethany is about two miles from Jerusalem. And that's really important when we deal with the chronology. Bethany was a city where the pilgrims stopped. And some of them, uh, coming from the north especially, some of the pilgrims who got sick stayed in Bethany. Uh, Bethany was known as a place where people got healed. Simon the leper was from Bethany. And so it was a place where sick people uh, uh, went. Maybe they had a spa, I'm not sure. I've been to Bethany, I didn't see the spa. But, uh, but that's where they could recover from the long uh, uh, journey. And so six days before, Jesus came to uh, Bethany on the 8th of Nisan. And what happened? Well, in typical fashion, uh, Mary and Martha threw a dinner party. And so the dinner party was a little more than a dinner party, though, because if you look at the chronology, it was actually Friday night. So it was actually a Sabbath dinner. So Yeshua came for the Sabbath dinner. And during that Sabbath dinner, a lot happened. Of course, um, uh, Martha, was, uh, Martha was serving, um, and uh, Mary took a pound of costly ointment, a pure nard, anointed the feet of Jesus, so he was anointed uh, for his death uh, with the nard at that point. Judas uh, one of the disciples who was going to betray him argued about spending all that money on perfume and uh, to anoint the Savior when, of course, he was pilfering uh, the uh, coin box. And then uh, Jesus, of course, refers again to his death, let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you, did not, you do not always have me. People, do you think that these folks knew he was going to die? No, absolutely not. Did Jesus know he was going to die? He was, his face was like flint towards Jerusalem. He knew on Nisan the 8th that he had six days left. And so he was moving towards his death on Passover. Now, Nisan the 9th would have been Saturday, a Sabbath, five days before the Passover. And a number of critical events, of course, took place at that Sabbath dinner. But something else was stirring in Jerusalem at that time. In chapter 11, verse 57 of John, we read, The chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he was to report it, Lazarus, so they might seize him. Later on in uh, chapter 12, verse 9 through 11, the large crowd of the Jewish people learned that Jesus was there, and they came not for Jesus alone, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death also. Because of an account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that there were religious Jews who didn't like Jesus, that knew he was going to Bethany because they were tracking him. They didn't put it in a GPS on him, but Jesus was being tracked at this point by his enemies. And he came to Bethany, and guess who also came to Bethany? His enemies. And they had to stay the night in Bethany because the next day was the Sabbath and they couldn't travel. And so Jesus and his enemies were all in Bethany at the same time. I remember a number of years ago, um, we had a group um, of anti-missionaries. You know what an anti-missionary is? It's someone who spends their life opposing me. And Doug and, and others on the chosen people's staff. 
So I mean, I think it's a blessing that we've actually created jobs. <laughs> and so there was a group of anti-missionaries that went over to, uh, uh, actually was in Hoboken at a hotel. And these anti-missionaries came and were trying to talk people out of believing in Jesus. And uh, they worked pretty hard at it. And the conference was Friday night and Saturday. And so I wasn't too upset about that. I didn't mind arguing them, with them until I was standing by the front desk. And one of the guys uh, told the person at the front desk, uh, uh, we need rooms for, for tonight. Well, they were Orthodox Jews. They couldn't travel. And then he said something that really bent me out of shape. He said, and we would like the conference right. <laughs> so we, I couldn't keep quiet at that point. I started yelling at him. Very sorry I did that, but not that sorry. <laughs> but it was, again, it was an illustration. Religious Jews can't travel on the Sabbath. Jesus was perfect according to the law. He couldn't travel either. And so basically, uh, it's my understanding that nothing happened on Saturday. It was a boring, restful day. It was all quiet on the Bethany front. But the action began picking up on Sunday. And Sunday was a very important day. It was Nisan the 10th. Now, Nisan the 10th is what we now call the triumphal entry. In fact, Nisan the 10th is supposed to be today. However, according to the Jewish calendar, it's tomorrow. What's a day? But according to the Jewish calendar, it's tomorrow. But the, the action picks up. And uh, so in John 12, 12, when Jesus says, on the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hoshienu, Hoshienu, Hosanna, blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. So you have to ask yourself the question, were they confused? It was about to be Passover, and it looked like they were celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. So much so that they actually quoted a messianic psalm. Hoshienu, blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so they actually thought it would be tabernacles. Why? Because this is complicated. But in Zechariah 14, we read that the Gentiles in the kingdom will celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. If not, they will experience drought. And so in Judaism, for the longest time, it is understood that the Feast of Tabernacles is the kingdom holiday, and it's even open to Gentiles. And so it, it's a very important uh, holiday. And so they were basically thinking that it was a kingdom event. Now, Jesus, instead of entering as a king, sat on a, a donkey and rode into Jerusalem humbly. Now, I hope you didn't say this, Raphael, but if you did, it's okay. Two Jews, three opinions. Some people will make a case that a donkey was so, some sort of royal animal, and they rode in, that kings rode on donkeys. That's not true. Raphael's shaking his head, so I'm safe. Okay, it's absolutely not true. It's a sign of humility. And it was fulfilling a messianic prophecy. So he came not as a king, because he knew what was going to happen. He came as a humble servant who knew he would be rejected, who knew that he would eventually be rejected, and who knew that he would be uh, crucified. Now, something else happened on the 10th day of Nisan. And that's back in Exodus chapter 12. And I don't want to read the whole thing to you. But in Exodus chapter 12, uh, we read about the choosing of the lamb. 
And so according to Exodus 12, the lamb, a perfect, unblemished, one-year-old lamb, is selected out of the flock on the 10th of Nisan. It is then kept for four days in order to make sure that it's perfect. And then on the 14th day, Passover, it is slain and the blood is poured out and put on the door. That's the first Passover. So, in a sense, when Jesus starts marching into Jerusalem, he is presenting himself to the Jewish people in a new way, as the Lamb of God selected for sacrifice. He rides in on a donkey. He doesn't ride in as a king. He rides in in humility because he knew that would happen. And then for the rest of the week, if you want to understand the last week of Jesus' life, a lot went on. But for the most part, he was being tempted and tested. And he was being, he was, people were arguing with him. People were rejecting him. All of this was going on in order to demonstrate that Jesus was the right person. He was the one that they were waiting for. He was perfect. And so he went through a lot during that last week. Now, if we can keep going, Jaden. So he enters as a humble king. They recite a kingdom psalm, Psalm 118. But Jesus is not coming in as a king, but they think he's coming in as a king. And the disciples think he's coming in as a king, but he's not coming as, as a king. He's coming in as a lamb to be slaughtered. Now, next slide. Nisan the 12th, the Tuesday, is actually identified in Matthew chapter 26, verses uh, 1 and 2. We read this. When Jesus had finished these words after the Olivet Discourse, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man is to be handed over for crucifixion. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas, and they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise a riot might occur among the people. And it's very interesting, I think, that they decided to not capture him two days before Passover. Because if they did and crucified him early, it would have ruined the whole plan. So God worked through the Jewish leaders who were opposing Jesus by causing them to be frightened of capturing Jesus for fear that they would be overrun by riots by the Jewish people. Jesus was on the clock. The plan was unfolding. This was Tuesday, two days before the day. Now, Nisan the 14th, we all know about, and I'm not going to say a lot about the, the, uh, the last uh, Seder, because Raphael is going to say everything next week. Two weeks? Two weeks you're going to do it. Okay. A little late, but that's okay. Um, we're having a, a Seder on Tuesday night at the Yale Club. That's a little early, so you know, so I understand. So, but some people try and figure out when the Last Supper was held. The Last Supper was a very primitive Passover Seder. There are all the elements of the Seder, the cups, the reclining, the dippings, everything was all set. It was absolutely a very early form of the Passover Seder. And it was held on Thursday night. Why was it held on Thursday night? Because it was the 14th of Nisan. That's when he sat down uh, to the Passover Seder. Now, next slide. And so, then came the first day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Passover and unleavened bread were already merged into an eight-day feast by that time. Jesus sent Peter and John to prepare the way. He said, where's the guest room, Peter and John asked. And they left and found everything just to say they had told them, and they prepared uh, the Passover. Next slide. And then things began heating up. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. 
The chief priests and the scribes were seeking how they might put him to death, for they were afraid of the people. Satan entered Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of twelve. He went away, discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money, so he consented and began to seeking a good opportunity to betray him to them apart from the crowd. So next slide. So then Jesus is betrayed after the Seder. So you're still on the 14th of Nisan. Jesus is then subjected to five different examinations, or some people would look at them as trials. For me, they were not a trial because only the Romans could actually uh, convict him of guilt and put him to death. The Jewish people could not do that without Roman intervention. So Pilate had to do that, not, not the Jewish leaders. And then after the last examination, Jesus is crucified. And the crucifixion happened on Passover. Why? Because Thursday night was the beginning of Friday. You see? And so, when was the Lamb of God crucified? On Passover. His entire last week involved him meeting his destiny on Passover. And so Thursday night, he had the Seder. He's betrayed, he's examined, he's tested, he's up the entire night. And then that very next morning, probably at about 9 a.m., he is crucified. And then, probably around 3 p.m., he dies. Now, just a word about, his, um, about the time of his death. According to Jewish literature, the Mishnah, there was a communal sacrifice of a Passover lamb at the temple at about two or three in the afternoon on that Friday, on the day of Passover. You won't read about it in the Bible because it's not there. But Josephus talks about it, Jewish literature talks about it, but very simply, it would mean, even though it's not in the Bible, it would mean that when Jesus actually died, he died at the same time that communal lamb was being sacrificed in the temple. He died as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then Jesus is buried. He's locked tight in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Roman guards are surrounding him. But instead of remaining in the tomb, Jesus, of course, rises from the dead. And when does he rise? He rises exactly when he was supposed to rise. He rises on the third day. Now, those of you who are literalists and want 24-hour days, for all three days, you're just not going to get it. Because if so, you'll have to start, you'll have to have the Last Supper on Wednesday, and that just doesn't work. Number one, it's bad. Uh, it, it doesn't fit the typology. And number two, it's not biblical. Okay? He, you can't. <laughs> I remember once that I was talking to one of our Gentile administrators at Chosen People Ministries, and uh, they'd asked me a question. They said, Mitch, the Day of Atonement is one of our days off, but the Day of Atonement this year falls out on a Sunday. So do we get a commensurate day off? And I said, you're kidding. They said, no, seriously, it's, it's in, in, in our employee manual. I said, don't you understand? You can't change the Jewish holidays. They invade, they fall whenever God wants them to fall according to the calendar. So no, there's no commensurate day off. The Jewish holidays must happen when they happen. Passover has to happen on the 14th of Nisan. Can't put it off to the 16th. And so Jesus died as the Lamb of God on Passover exactly as 
the scriptures said, and he was in the grave part of three days and three nights. That's an a, a, uh, idiom for three days. So they just say three days and three nights. So he had to die on Passover. He definitely rose on Sunday because it's called the first day of the week. So we're stuck. But fortunately, if you know a little bit about Jewish tradition, in Judaism, I want you to know that this subject of whether or not a part of a day counts as a day in reckoning for certain issues, everybody knows it's true. There's not even a, I mean, the Talmud debates everything, but they don't debate this. There's no debate. Uh, one portion in rabbinic writings, just listen, Rabbi Eliezer, who was the 10th in the descent from Ezra, maybe yes, maybe no, stated, a day and night are a portion of time, and the portion of, of this portion of time, which is called an onah, is as the whole of it. it. It's common. So if a leper was healed, and you needed to wait a certain amount of time to allow them back into the community, do you start it? At 24, if they're healed at 10 a.m., do you then have to go 24 hours to the, to the next 10 a.m.? No. There's just so many instances like that in the Bible, in the, in, in the Torah, in the five books of Moses. And so, without a doubt, a portion of a day is considered a day. And so, clearly, Yeshua dies on Passover, Friday morning. He expires at about 2 or 3 p.m. when that communal lamb was sacrificed. He's in the grave Friday, Saturday, and on Sunday, he's raised from the dead. Next one. Again, just coincidentally. Next one, Jaden. The day that Jesus rose from the dead is actually the 16th of Nisan, the day after uh, the Sabbath attached to the Passover. And we read in Leviticus 23, speak to the sons of Israel and say, when you enter the land, I'm going to give you to reap its harvest. Then you shall bring in the sheep of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted on the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So what does that mean? It means that Jesus died as the Lamb of God and raises as the first fruits of the resurrection. No coincidences with God. He is working out his plan as detailed by the festivals as prophecies, and he accomplishes that plan. Paul writes, but each in his own order, Messiah the first fruits, after that, those who are Messiahs at his coming. And so we see that the last week of Jesus' life was pre planned before the foundation of the earth, woven throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. Jesus understood it perfectly. And Jesus submitted himself to the plan of God. Now, he did have a weak moment, certainly, in the garden, as any of us would have. But Jesus understood he was born to die. But he also understood fully that he would rise from the dead. So he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We have a great basis to go out and tell others about the Messiah. We stand on the firm, sure ground of Scripture. Jesus worked out the plan of God in his life for our benefit because he loves us and because he was obedient to the plan of God. One last thought, and then we're going to show a quick movie in close. If God had a plan for Jesus. It was detailed. It was created over thousands of years. If he had that plan, don't you think he's got one for you? It's just that, see, we all do it. That plan, unfortunately, is probably unknown to you. 
but it's not unknown to him. He knew who you were before you were born. And your life is a process whereby God is working out his plan for you. He's got great things for you to do. Those great things might involve suffering too. I mean, Jesus was perfect, we're not, and he suffered. He suffered for a purpose. But sometimes so do we. I heard the prayer request, so many illnesses, so much sickness, so much suffering. And if you don't have it, just hang in there long enough and you'll, you'll get it. <laughs> and so all through our lives, we can trust in our magnificent God, who is all-knowing and has our lives mapped out. If I knew exactly what he wanted from me, I'd probably be a better participant. But I don't know. We look through a glass darkly. We need to trust him. But the life of Jesus teaches us that God has a plan for us. And let me tell you, it may not be easy, but it will be good. Because he loves you.